Oh my God, I literally have the world's biggest collection of designer face masks right now. It's like <laughs> one for every day of the week at the very least. Hi guys, my name is Alex Padilla. I'm the style director of Women's Wear Daily. I'm here with my lovely colleague, Joel de Rich, the bureau chief from Paris. We just finished Paris Fashion Week and we have ended the month of fashion shows that started in New York. Joel, I'm so happy with speaking. This has been such an interesting fashion week. Can you please talk to me about your personal experience? Well, my first feeling about this fashion week is hallelujah, we survived because it was, it was a weird one. So we had um, compared to 90 plus fashion shows usually in Paris, we had 20, which I guess on the upside is 20 more than we had in July when we had the men's and the couture shows. So we're making progress, but it was definitely a very bizarre hybrid fashion week. There were all this news in the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal about how Paris was going under a lockdown. Do you ever feel unsafe? Because I was worried about you and I kept on texting you about it. It was the weirdest mix of normality and then most utter chaos. So for example, the day before the Cauchy show, which was in a park, the um, government in Paris announced that there would be a ban on gatherings um, of more than I think 10 people in public parks. So we were like, is the show happening? Is it not happening? And it went ahead, they got a special exemption, but I think there was a hell of a lot of jockeying behind the scenes. Of, and you know, at the same time, I think the authorities here really wanted the fashion week to go ahead because it's a huge economic sector for France. And in the end, it kind of magically all went according to plan. But there was that backdrop always of chatter and not knowing of what tomorrow was going to be made and is the government suddenly going to shut everything down before we get to the final day. I think it was the, the final day of the day before last was Chanel and that was a big show. Yeah, that was pretty much I think the biggest show of the week because it was about 500 people. And, you know, it felt safe, we were distanced in our seating, but it was really nice to get back to that kind of feeling of the really big, majestic show in the Grand Palais that Chanel is super well known for. The one thing with that show that really struck me is that the pictures online of the collection didn't look as nice as they did when you were there in person. And that was such a good illustration of why sometimes it's important to be able to be physically present at an event. Talk to me about some of the other favorite live shows. Balmain, I thought was a really fun show. It was at night, it was super atmospheric. There was all this dry ice. We were in the botanical gardens and people showed up super dressed up, which you know we hadn't seen in months. And then he had, as I'm sure you saw, all the virtual front rows with um, JLo and Luma and um, all these celebrities. And then the collection was way over the top. It was way, you know, typical Olivier's vision of glamour with these pointy shoulders that were great kind of social distancing tools for keeping people <laughs> out of your way. <laughs> and then a lot of people were talking about the Isabelle Moran show, mm -hmm. which also had that kind of performance aspect the pure kind of joy and freedom that fashion can bring in which you know hasn't seemed so relevant in the last few months but at the end of the day i think that's something people are starting to crave again there was a sense of 80s of debbie harris kim wilde and i love a big shoulder and i love metallic anything hot pants in acid wash you have me there i want you to talk to me about LV because that was another one of those physical shows. We were in La Samaritaine, which is an old historic French department store that's been completely renovated. It's taken 15 years. It's like the never ending saga, but all the restoration work has been done inside. And it's this Art Nouveau murals that we sat, mm -hmm. you know, around and it was just amazing. And the fashion was again, you know, typical Nicolas Gesquier. He's never like within a seasonal trend. He always does something that seems completely apart. I think it's because he feels that responsibility usually being the very last show of the whole fashion month. If he does anything that is linked to trend, it's gonna look like he's copying something that's already been seen. And here it was all about gender fluidity. I like the idea of an in-between garment. Uh, how do you dissolve 
what's masculine, what's feminine, that a time traveling 80s genderless vision is for me such a candy moment because I love that idea. The way he envisioned masculine feminine power suiting was very interesting to me. I mean, you have to give it to him. He's always creating new concepts and thinking outside the box. Talking about show in a box, can you talk to me about presentations and Loewe specifically? Yeah, I think Jonathan Anston has really blown everyone away with his way of dealing with adversity and just being creative and coming up with different formats. And this time it was kind of like one of those big boxes that artists used to carry around their sketches. And instead mm -hmm. you had these wallpaper sized printouts of the different looks from the collection. Um, and so you could see them life size, even though you weren't there. And then in parallel, there was the physical component, which was a showroom in Paris, where for one morning only, you could go and see the most beautiful pieces in the collection um, on mannequins, like an exhibition. He really managed to create a hybrid. I do also love the celebration of heritage, Spanish craftsmanship in terms of leather works. I mean, I love the puzzle bag. It's been one of the hit runs for him as a designer. But when you have it with big sequin pieces, it's kind of really great. Let's take a little step back for a second and let's go into a specific trend. You and I love the 90s. We have discussed oh, this. Yeah. Oh yeah. But I am not talking about the kind of norm core 90s that Gen Z is so in love with. I want all these kids who are wearing horrible turtlenecks last seen on Friends to look at the work of Helmut Lang, look at Calvin Klein in the 90s. Daddy? What the hell is that? A dress. Says who? Calvin Klein. I mean, yes. just pure minimal line. Talk to us about how is this, how did designers today took that 90s minimal reference? For me, nobody did it better than um, Nadezh Vani Sibolsky this season at Hermes. That was a real Helmut Langish moment for me because she had these bodysuits that were completely cut out at the back and most of the side cut out as well. It is so much sexier than what we've seen from Hermes in the last few years. And those bodysuits were paired with a very simple leather A-line skirt that sat kind of low on the hip. So and then a pair of clogs. I don't think it gets much more 90s than that. You had bondo tops worn with everything from the trouser suits to those A-line skirts. You had flesh tones, black and a shot of lipstick red. And then another brand that did a really cute, fun, quirky version of the 90s is Miu Miu. Right. Because Miu Miu, I mean, the original ads from the 90s, I love. And I felt she really captured that flavor this season with a kind of very uh, playful, very colorful mm -hmm. um, 90s uh, fashion, very sporty, very cute. I mean, I love a micro mini skirt as well and the kitten heel sneaker. All those things were so 90s. Talk to us about Valenciaga and their video. I mean, 80s throwback, right? Sunglasses at night. <laughs> I haven't been able to get it out of my head. Thanks, Valenciaga. <laughs> and then it was this kind of very inky Paris atmosphere of mm -hmm. you know the streets that we like to wander and to be honest you know it still feels like a privilege being allowed to wander the streets of Paris after spending the whole spring locked up so I think that really talks about that sense of freedom I mean the clothes were so sharp they were so cool who doesn't want to wear one of these coats you know who doesn't want to wear one of the, the spangly dresses Another 90s example was Paco Rabanne. Julian Dusenas did such a wonderful job. There was a, basically some kind of like high class thrift store. Yeah, it just felt like super upscale grunge, didn't it? Right, um, correct. That kind of like Courtney Love, but kind Absolutely. of dressed up. There was a lot of crop tops and the use of denim. Crop tops being another huge trend, not only in Paris, but in all the fashion weeks. I mean, when do you get to say Chanel, Miu Miu, Hermes, Altozora, Gucci in the same sentence? But what about our COVID spread, Alex? How are we gonna hide it with these crop tops? That's my question. I really <laughs> we'll don't- We'll a couple of pounds in that area, you know? It's like- <laughs> 
That brings me to my next su subject, Gabriella Hurst. It's the first time Gabriella Hurst is shown in Paris, and we've heard a lot about her, especially because LVMH actually invested in her brand last year. So we knew that people here were paying attention. There were these crochet dresses that she actually had made by a, a not-for-profit association called Manos del Uruguay. And uh, they do all this fantastic crochet work that if you go in the showroom and you pick one up, it is light as a feather. It is just beautiful work. And I think that was the point of the whole collection, being able to see it in a kind of quiet setting at close quarters. It really made you appreciate the leather work, the tassels. It really encapsulates what we're talking about comfort and ease. Comfort and ease is another trend that we saw of just those clothes that you want to feel cozy in. And she's a master at it. I want to talk now that we have gone through some of the trends. I love the idea of the feel good, but there is something about reality. There was something about protection. Can we talk about face masks? You mentioned to me that some designers gave you face masks. Oh my God, I literally have the world's biggest collection of designer face masks right now. They were ranging from like kind of poetic. So at um, Kenzo, um, it was a printed scarf and you slide your surgical face mask inside it. So you have that on underneath. Then they had like the kind of technical ones where, you know, you get the disclaimer on it saying, this is a fashion accessory. This is not like protecting you um, from Vuitton, which was kind of a knit one. So yeah, everybody came up with their own version, but you know, Kuba, our um, street style photographer, mm -hmm. he actually said something super interesting. Not a lot of people use masks to make a fashion statement. They were just sticking with the surgical mask. I don't feel that there is a big groundswell of people wanting to be playful with the mask. The mask is annoying. We just want it to be gone from our wardrobes forever. I sort of aligning with your thinking. I feel that a lot of people just really want to take masks seriously. And um, I do think that turning that into the ultimate accessory, it takes away from the seriousness of the issue. In this case, in this fashion week, there were some elements of protection. We saw it at Margiela, we saw it at Paco Rabanne, as you said. We saw it at Rick Owens and at Kenzo, Marine Serre. But I do think one thing is to make a fashion statement at a runway moment. Another thing is to actually go and create a make mask into a fashion accessory. As you say, Rick Owens is like a super powerful statement about how to dress protectively mm -hmm. uh, for an era in which we need to feel a little bit, you know, like we need, need a bit of an armor sometimes to go out into the world. And he did it in the most beautiful, interesting, relevant way. So some of these designers, they really managed to capture the feeling of the moment, definitely. If you have to choose a favorite show, there's so many, do you have any personal favorite show? I'll tell you the one that made me think the most. It was the Yoji Yamamoto show. You know how Yoji's shows are very slow. Yes. Very, very, very slow. And you know how sometimes that can make you feel during fashion week. One is not always in the right frame of mind for this kind of pace. This time, honestly, it felt so right. It felt so right to take the time. And I'm a sleeve maniac. And I'm watching this duster coat go by very, very slowly on the Yamamoto runway. And I'm thinking this sleeve is just perfection. I mean, mm -hmm. it is so beautiful in its proportions. And I was thinking, you know, this is what it's about. It's about really paying attention. Mm -hmm. And it felt like an eye opener, honestly. So you were talking about a sleeve construction. This is something that it's obviously very interesting from our Zoom times to have details around the shoulder, around the neck. I think that we saw a lot of those influences and the big sleeve is definitely very Zoom ready, I wanna say. I mean, you could really see that people were designing from the waist up and to make it as exciting as possible within the frame of a, a computer screen. Obviously, you and I did not get the memo for that. <laughs> Look oh. at us. <laughs> Joelle, it's so nice to see you. And in fact, I cannot wait to see you face to face very soon. I do miss riding in the car with you, Alex, and catching up on gossip. I need you to come back next season. Oh yeah, because people don't know this, but our moving office that is a car is a place full of gossip and good times. Don't forget to go to www.com for all your reviews and roundups of the Paris shows and all the rest of Fashion Weeks.